Hi, my name is Anastasia Abubakar and in this video I'm going to be talking about the touch of the harpsichord. Um, as you can see, this is my own baby and in my unbiased opinion, I think the harpsichord is actually one of the most beautiful, expressive and colourful instruments out there. Um, however, uh, it has sometimes gotten uh, a bit of a reputation for sounding a uh, small insipid and somewhat like a typewriter or a sewing machine and um, that is because unfortunately uh, it it can be played that way if if one doesn't um, approach it in the way that it needs to be approached and so um, today I, I'm going to try and um, it, talk about the, the the mechanism of the harpsichord and how to give voice to the beautiful sound that it has and hopefully um, help all of us to um, avoid these ways in which the harpsichord can be made to sound like a typewriter or a sewing machine. So uh, my first um, my first order of business is to ex explain the mechanism of the harpsichord, which is actually quite straightforward. It's um, the, the big difference between the harpsichord and the piano, um, even though they both have strings, it's just that the harpsichord is, strings are being plucked by quills instead of being hit by hammers. And um, the, the implication of this is that the harpsichord needs a lot less weight than the piano does, which is um, which is which is true. But in in my experience, whenever uh, pianists or organists have sat down at the harpsichord for the very first time, it's um, they they struggle to get the, the the keys to even depress. It's just a, a huge effort to make the the keys go down. And that can be attributed to this plucking mechanism. So even though the, the actual weight that it takes for the quill to pluck the string is a lot less than, say, the weight that one would need in order to depress a piano key because a hammer needs to you know, get up, jump up and, and hit the string, this resistance, the, this point of resistance uh, this this plucking point that produces this resistance actually um, throws a lot of keyboard players for a loop, um, and so the their their tendency is to just use brute force and to just you know using the technique that they're familiar with to just go down and oh my four foot's on um, to just go down and um, and and use force to to get the to depress the key and the the result of that is that sometimes especially if you hit hard enough you will hear the jack popping up and hitting the jack rail which is this piece of wood here that keeps all the jacks down and as a result you'll get this wooden sound can you hear that that accompanies your playing, which obviously is not desirable. And the other effect of that is that the the, the harpsichord just um, it produces a sound that is loud at first, but just collapses immediately. And I think this is where um, where the the reputation the harpsichord's reputation for sounding small probably comes from. This. This instrument is, by virtue of its mechanism, is such that the more force you you put into it, the more weight, and the more you try and you know uh, use speed and and heaviness and force to to get a sound out of it, the more the instrument will absolutely collapse and and sound wise will collapse and just and shut down and not ring at all. So that is the. Um, the the way uh, the harpsichord can be approached by by people who who haven't played it before and how um, this resistance 
makes them automatically want to use weight because how else do we get this key down? And so um, the remedy to that is to actually use our fingers to imitate the mechanism that is happening in here. So if the, if the sound is being produced by a quill plucking the strings, we have to make a plucking motion with our fingers. And I, at this juncture, I like to liken harpsichord touch to pizzicato touch on, on a string instrument and how um, the, the way you pluck the string can actually determine how resonant and how much bloom the sound has. And obviously, if a, a violin player does this, it's going to have a sound that just goes up. But if you draw the sound out, you know, the, the, the strings will be free to resonate and vibrate freely. And so, with the harpsichord, the most important thing is the pluck. And this plucking motion comes from these, just the very tip of your fingers where, um, where you had, you'll notice that you had muscles that you had no idea were there. At least I wasn't aware of them when I first started playing the harpsichord. And, and all the control comes from those tiny muscles at the tip. So if you're at your harpsichord, sit, just sit down and place your finger on a key and feel that, just depress it to the point of resistance. And that resistance is basically the, the quill pushing up against the, the, the string just about to be plucked. Feel that resistance and then start stroking the keys in very, very tiny moment, movements, just using the tip of your finger. So stroke. And then now as you're stroking, pretend you're, you are actually plucking the string like the quill is doing. So sort of wrap your finger around it and depress the key. And you notice how if, if you make that plucking motion with your fingertips that that resistance um, ceases to become an obstacle to the key going down anymore. And, and you notice how much bigger the sound is. So I'm going to play the two sounds back to back. So this is, um, you know, s trying to get over the resistance with force. And this is with the plucking motion. Can you hear the difference? With one, with this one, the sound just dies. It, it's there and it dies immediately. Whereas with this one, the sound starts off small and just blooms and blooms and just keeps and keeps going. This is the sound we want. And this is the sound that enables the harpsichord to sound resonant and, and voluptuous and, and gorgeous and to just have, to be able to fill a room. And so um, it's, it's something that, you, it, that one needs to get used to. Um, even though I've been playing the harpsichord for many years now, if I go through a period of playing a lot more piano, which one has to do in order to earn one's bread and butter, I uh, I often find that it takes me a while to reactivate these tiny little muscles here because they are just simply I not used in piano playing, and um, and so uh, the these muscles will need to be trained. And I guess the next question would be how on earth do we play so fast if we have to be stroking each you know each key. And doesn't that take an awful lot of time? And um, the answer is, well, there are two answers. The, the, first, uh, the first answer is that this stroking movement is actually quite subtle. It doesn't have to be a, a massive stroke. It can just be, you know, micrometers. It, it needs to happen because that is what um, corresponds to the mechanism of the harpsichord and will help um, bring the sound um, to its best, but it doesn't need to be big. It can it can happen in a split second. And the, the second answer to that question is that um, you have to keep your fingers very close to the keys so that um, 
so that before it, a new a note is due to be played, you can actually start the pluck. Whereas if your fingers are airborne, by the time they get to the key and start the pluck, it's probably going to be way too late. So I would even go as far to say as um, my fingers are always very very close to the keys, except when I want to make a you know a downbeat or a an accent or. Then I would lift my hand off the key for a bit. But apart from that, my hands are always um, right next to the keys. And that way, while the previous note is being sounded, the next finger can start with the clock. And that's how you'll be able to play really fast. Like... While still having that um, wonderful resonant sound that just carries and um, and is is really beautiful. So that's um, the video on on touch, um, and I will go into articulation and inflection and all the rest of the good stuff in in more videos. Thank you.